This is the second set of notes about Chapter 5, The Working Cell. This part is about, pass, about facilitated diffusion and active transport. So some molecules are too big or too strongly charged and can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Some small ones like water and oxygen and things like that can just slip right between the phospholipids and the, and the layer. But others are too big or are charged molecules and they can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer. So there is such a thing as facilitated diffusion. This, this involves special channel proteins in the membrane to allow things to pass through. Some channel proteins are just like tubes that, do, that, cell, that um, molecules can pass through. Others are special proteins that change shape when they come in contact with the molecule. But the molecules are still moving from high concentration to low, like diffusion. So it is still diffusion. Um, and there's no energy involved, so it's still considered passive transport. Active transport requires the cell to use energy. In active transport, the molecules are moving against the concentration gradient. They're moving from low concentration to higher rather than higher to lower. So let's watch this video about passive and active transport. To stay alive, a cell must exchange materials with its environment. Some materials move in and out of the cell by a process called passive transport. Other materials must be carried across in a process called active transport. The membrane of a cell is semi-permeable. This means that some small molecules, such as oxygen and water, can diffuse across freely. Carbon dioxide and amino acids can also diffuse into or out of the cell. The net movement of molecules depends upon their concentration inside versus outside the cell. Molecules move naturally from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. When molecules move in this way, no energy is required, and they are said to move by passive transport. Molecules with strong electrical charges, such as ions, cannot simply diffuse across the cell membrane. No matter how small the ions are, their charge prevents them from moving through the layer of lipid tails in the middle of the membrane. Many molecules, including proteins, are simply too large to diffuse across the cell membrane. Carbohydrates, such as sugars and starches, are also too large to diffuse across. Large molecules are transported across the membrane by carrier proteins in the membrane. Glucose, a sugar, is one molecule transported in this way. Glucose attaches to the carrier protein. The protein changes shape and releases the glucose molecule inside the cell. In this way, glucose is moved down its concentration gradient from the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. Like diffusion, this process, called facilitated transport, requires no energy. It is, therefore, another example of passive transport. Cells must also pump molecules against a concentration gradient. Ions, such as sodium and potassium, are moved in this way. Again, a special carrier protein, in this case the sodium-potassium pump, is involved. ATP transfers energy to the carrier protein. This causes the carrier protein to change shape so that sodium ions readily bind to it. The binding of sodium causes another shape change and the sodium ions are released outside the cell. The protein can now bind potassium ions. When the potassium ions bind, the protein once again changes shape and the potassium ions are released inside the cell. At this point, the energy gained from ATP has been used up. The sodium-potassium pump needs energy from another ATP to repeat the cycle. The pump moves sodium ions against their concentration gradient. It also moves potassium ions against their concentration gradient. Moving ions this way requires energy and thus is an example of active transport. So active transport is a process of moving things using energy, moving things against the concentration gradient. Several different kinds of active transport exist. One kind that we just saw illustrated in the video is a pump. 
uh, small molecules and ions can cross the membrane via these pumps. The pumps require energy. The example shown in the video, as well as the example given here, is the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump pushes three sodium ions outside the cell and brings two potassium ions inside the cell. This is an important process in the transmission of nerve impulses. The transmission of nerve impulses requires a difference in charge between the two side, the outside and the inside of the membrane. And this is accomplished by moving sodium ions and potassium ions against their gradient to, to change the, the concentration of ions inside and outside the cell to provide the potential difference necessary for the nerve transmission. So there are other ways that large molecules and large particles can get through membranes besides having a pump. Their two main processes are endocytosis and exocytosis. Endo means inside, so endocytosis is a method of bringing material into the cell by means of the membrane being enfolded, folded inward. And there are two main ways this happens, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Phagocytosis is the ingestion of or the enfolding of solid materials into the cell. The word phagocytosis means cell eating, and so this is how some single-celled organisms like amoebas eat by, by surrounding the food particle with extensions of their cytoplasm and bringing the vacuole inside the cell. Pinocytosis is very similar to phagocytosis except it involves liquids, droplets of liquids like water rather than solids. The process of exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis. It is bringing materials out of the cell by means of pushing the, or having membranes come in contact with each other. The video that is, that is shown is a link over here. I'm not going to show it in the middle of this, of this recording, but I have posted the video links on Edmodo. I encourage you strongly, if you have not seen it, or even if you have seen it, this is an excellent video to show you what happens with the membranes as exocytosis and endocytosis are occurring. So the process that a white blood cell or that a one cell protestin would use to bring things into the cell would be phagocytosis, bringing in solid materials inside the cell by folding the membrane inward. This video shows an example of how this works, but please be sure to watch the other video link that I posted separately on the mother because it shows an excellent example of what happens with the cell membrane. Cells can move large particles across the membrane by bulk transport. Bulk transport into the cell is called endocytosis. Bulk transport out of the cell is called exocytosis. During endocytosis, the cell membrane folds into a pouch surrounding particles outside the cell. A vesicle is formed. This vesicle carries the particles into the cell and can release its contents into the cytoplasm. Human white blood cells engulf bacteria and other unwanted cells. This process is called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is another example of endocytosis. Once inside the cell, the vesicle containing the bacteria fuses with another vesicle called a lysosome. The lysosome contains digestive juices which destroy the bacteria. Exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis. Particles are transported out of the cell. A vesicle containing wastes, or cell products, moves toward the cell membrane. The membrane surrounding the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane. The contents of the vesicle are secreted as the membrane smooths out. So this concludes the notes about um, facilitated diffusion and active transport. Be certain that you look at the other video links that I posted separately on Edmodo so that you can see the other YouTube videos that, um, that go along with these, this set of notes.